I think I started um, thinking about being a doctor when I was a very young child. I remember uh, looking at the movies and I thought about the jungle and working outdoors. And there was always a priest and a doctor. Uh, of course, I didn't identify with the priest, but I identified with the doctor. So my idea was really being out there, helping the world um, in this position of being a doctor. So it's, it's a very, very far away memory and desire to help and be out there. There was no reference in my family, but I think that my mother really wished to be a doctor. So I'm the doctor she never became. She married very young, she was 18 years old, her mother was sick, so they sort of rushed to marry her. So, and she never studied. And so I think that that was me. It was her wish to be a doctor. Uh, I inherited it. Angola was fantastic. It was warm, right? I have memories being in my father's shoulders and at the beach, at night, camping with a little boat, and, but crabs walking on the sand. So it was <laughs> these, the stars and these beautiful things, but that there was always something to challenge, challenging in the world. Even the beautiful things had their part. You see that life was, is really a fiction in your mind. I'm sure it didn't happen like that. But that's how I remember. <laughs> Actually, I remember being born <laughs> because my mother tells the story all the time. <laughs> so how do you, this autobiographic memory ends up by being part of you? Because it's a funny story. She went to the hospital and I was born. You know, I became a doctor during the revolution in Portugal. So I, I felt insecure because a lot of the studies we did were um, administrative uh, exams, so we actually didn't study. So we just became doctors and we weren't really prepared for it. And we were sent out in the countryside in 1975. And although I didn't feel prepared to be a doctor, I loved it. I went into these villages, I had to be a doctor of all these schools and children and pregnant women that lived in my small village. And it was something that I would never experience again in my life. But being that, that doctor was very important for me. Um, later on, I think that um, I, one thing I noticed and that changed my whole life was that at that time, we had no adults around us. There was no backup. We were completely alone, and if I had some questions about what to do, there was nobody to call. I had to call other friends. And I, had, I made a decision, I guess, at that time, maybe not very conscious, because I became a doctor at the age of 21. I sort of made that decision that later on, as an adult and experienced doctor, I would always help young doctors. I would make the environment trusting and let them make mistakes and I would be there for them. That was also very important. And then I decided to move to New York and that was great. <laughs> I spent 10 years in New York being a doctor, trained to be a doctor there. And that was one of the most important experiences. It really gave me all the backup I hadn't had in school. And then I said, no, I'd like to change people's lives and have time to do it, and that's the office. Being a human, and that allowed me to become a doctor. I only became a good doctor. Of course, I needed the science. New York helped a lot because we worked 100 hours a week. So it sort of gives you a lot of hours, right? Of giving medications and, and being protected by an environment. The American model is totally different from here. You know that you make a mistake and someone will come, doctor, was that really what you wanted to do? And you say, oh, sorry, I made a mistake. And that's possible in the United States, not here. 
If you make a mistake, they'll come after you with a knife. And that's the most difficult part of our society here, even with young people. You make a mistake and you're punished by your mistake. Every single mistake we make has to be a learning opportunity. And that really was really given to me by my father and by the United States, so by my, pr my training in New York. So I became a, a human because I accepted the errors and I learned how to cope with them. And that allowed me to become a doctor. Otherwise, I would be always in panic of hurting someone. When I came back from the United States, it was uh, late 80s. Okay, it was a good time in Portugal. There was a lot of money, a lot of growing of the economy, a lot of ch positive change in society. And I thought that most of the diseases we have in current times are due to our habits. The way we eat, the way we deal with our emotions, the way we deal with each other. And I realized that to make a difference, you needed to approach the human being, not just like a machine, you know, like a, a car that comes into the garage and you fix this, you fix that. So you had to go to the roots of the problems. I started studying nutrition. Um, and when I studied nutrition, I realized that I most of the problems with nutrition had to do with our emotions. So I started studying emotions and the mind. And at the same time, neuroscience was very um, growing and it was, had this explicit language finally, so that we could communicate about subjects that were taboos and that people didn't know how to talk about it. So it came quite early in my uh, career when I opened the office, okay, that one-on-one. -on -one. And again, I was lucky because I never really worked for any insurance company, any hospital. I worked and I decided then that I wanted one hour per patient. And that gives me a lot of time to listen to their story and to change things at that level. To inspire someone, you know, uh, you are motivating someone, right? And the first thing you need to, to do is connect, right? So you need to connect with this person. You need to open up their minds. You need to become resonant with them. It means my nervous system and their nervous system need to communicate. It's, it, it's actually physical and chemical waves, all right? And that depends a lot, I guess, in your experience, your personality, your training to be there for the person. So you create a trusting environment, okay? And then the person opens up and, and you start seeing and you go um, across conversations to, to really know this person in front of you. And when it connects, you know, it's like there is this moment, the person says, aha, so what you want to do is really like a surgeon, but another kind of surgeon. You have to connect with people's emotions and trust to go in and then change these beliefs. Tell stories that make them think, oh, maybe I can shift this. And if they do this shift, a lot of things happen. If I have to think that what's our biggest challenge nowadays as humans is because we are conscious of our own nature. Because if we weren't conscious of our own nature, we wouldn't be responsible to deal with it. But now we are conscious of it. We can put words in our nature. And part of our nature is nutrition, is movement, is our mind is the fact that we are social beings. 
So we need to have this in schools. We need to have this in OBGYN with a gynecologist teaching young mothers and young fathers about our nature. But what are we teaching? How to use the pill, you know, give medications. Uh, every time a patient comes to the doctor, we, we, don't, we don't really deal with the problems. We give a medication and we don't help people deal with feelings. And what are feelings? Are the way we t feelings are visual feelings, social feelings, mind feelings, emotional feelings, and everything these feelings are are signs that our body gives our mind about something that is not correct, even an abdominal pain. What do you do? You go to the doctor, and the doctor does what? Gives you a pill, and you ignore the abdominal pain. Nutrition is indeed um, a cornerstone because all there is back down there, I mean, we, we can live in, in a realm of ideas, but down there, it's all physics and chemistry, all right? So where do you get your chemistry? You get your chemistry from the oxygen, the air you breathe, from your movement, and from nutrition. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, they all come from the combination of bad nutrition and poor emotional regulation. You know, you, you eat sugar, you feel energy, and then people don't really understand what they're doing. So a lot of communication needs to be on the science of nutrition, explain people but with easy words and stories, how their body works down there. And they need to link that to their emotions. There's a, a new study came out in Scientific American uh, that really says that the biggest problem we have in nutrition is processed foods. And it has been my belief that if you jump back uh, before the Industrial Revolution, you already do a lot for yourself. Eat food, eat colors, move around. Avoid sugar, avoid bad fats, avoid processed foods, and you'll be all right. As you know, when we sleep, the brain uses 25% of your energy. Acting on everyday lives, and as you know, more than life, doesn't depend on physical work, depends on brain work. So we spend a lot of energy all day long. And now you want someone to spend more energy changing a habit from here to there, right? And although the brain is very neuroplastic, it wants to save energy. So it wants to repeat what it knows. And it really, in the beginning, doesn't give you any good chemistry, any good dopamine to when you want to change something. Actually, it punishes you. You want to change something and the brain says, oh, hold on, You've, you know, you, you trained me to do this all your life and now you want to do something else. So, you need to fight against this, this rigidity in the system that wants to save energy, wants to do what it knows. And how do you do that? You need to train the mind to be open, to be an observer of who you are and to be very objective about what's inside. So for that, you need to be very kind with your mind, okay? Because if you punish your mind, the brain retracts. No information will go in, not even from yourself to yourself. So if you need to change your nervous system, you need to be open and kind, and then monitor your attention. You're gonna have to train your attention going to have to pay attention to your intention. So you want to start drinking water, right? So you need first put that intention in your brain. That's important for me. Pay attention to that intention and repeat, repeat, repeat. What will happen? New connections in your brain. That's a new habit, right? But why don't people do it all the time? 
Well, not only the energy and the way the brain works doesn't help, most of the time we are exhausted, we, our attention is required in traffic, telephones, um, movies, books, new ideas. So who's going to think about the intention all day long? And as we know, what helps is to write the intention in your environment. Write down your intention in your mirror, in your kitchen, in your car, so that you create an environment that helps you remember your intention and your new habit. We have limits, and our limits are biological, are physical, are cultural, are at all dimensions. And if you don't know your limits, you will break that thin blue line between feeling energetic or feeling at loss, between having a fresh mind or a no-no mind. So fear is a way to let us know. It's again a feeling to make you stop, to reflect. Where are you? You know, is this wave on the beach too strong for me? Or is, is culture imposing me a need to, to show that I'm very strong and I, as a woman, I, I, I guess I wasn't very conscious of that, but I always grew and I always thought that I was stronger than my small body. And so I broke necks, you know, I fell from the horses because I needed to show that I was strong. But you need the fear to respect. It's a feeling and you can't ignore feelings. So it's a mistake not to listen to them. They're all important. I guess I failed a lot of times. <laughs> but as I told you, failures were always a step up. I remember one thing, I decided to do infectious diseases in New York. Oh, at the time where hospitals were occupied by AIDS. It was we were there when AIDS um, started, okay? With the first cases of AIDS disease. We would come back home and, oh, this weird infection, we didn't use gloves, we had no clue what was happening. Chronic diseases are not exactly my ball. So I finally gave up and I also gave up because where I was working, and it was very tough to decide, I'm not going to pursue this. So it's the first time I said, wrong decision. And it gave me this strength of deciding things in life, being right or wrong, and then say this was the wrong decision. So what? Make another decision. And I left that part of my studies or my practice. I was already a doctor and I chose something else. So every failure took me somewhere else, opened some other door. I'm a happy person. I'm extremely energetic, as you can see, by my gestures and the way I talk. And one of the things I learned that helped me a lot to stay energetic until now is actually every so often, I think every 10 years, I readjust my limits. Okay, I say, hmm, limits are a little bit closer. So I make myself very strong within those limits. So when I'm asked to go beyond my limits, it's okay, because I'm no, not always beyond my limits. And that's a big error society does all the time, because we are always being challenged to show that we are more than we are. You strengthen your core, and that has always helped me. So I, I shift well, which is something I let go of things well also. That's something that sometimes it's interesting when people look at you and say, oh, you are really the same meaning. And you, it's like, Oh, I was, you know, people are recognizing you in this long process of life. So that flexibility always helped me. Mind Blackout is really a passion right now. 
because it started in the office with young people. The name Mind Blackout really means about a project that teaches us when we stuck, how to get unstuck. And these young people were stuck in their emotions. Mostly depression, anxiety, panic attacks, um, problems dealing with who they are in a society, in an extremely complex and non-trusting society. We adults are not creating trusting environments for them to explore life. We're demanding too much without giving enough. So I put together in my consultations neuroscience, and because I studied clinical hypnosis, uh, because years ago it was uh, what the um, American Gastroenterology Association decided it was a, the most helpful skill for irritable bowel syndrome. So my husband, who's a gastroenterologist, told me, Mini, you like this stuff, go study this. So I went to London and studied clinical hypnosis. Later on, mindfulness came out and I studied mindfulness. Of course, the first to benefit was me and myself, right? Because I was discovering all these tools that made me more flexible, more resilient, where I most needed, right? With the people I love. Because that's the place we are less flexible and less, more rigid. So I started teaching this to young people. I taught them neuro neuroscience. I taught them mindfulness. Then I thought, you know, these kids don't know how to step in life with their bodies and their voices. So I called my friends from theater and they joined me and they come up with communication. They, they dress these kids up, they throw them in, in more confident in, in stages of life. Like there was this 16 year old young woman and she was moving from school to university and she felt insecure about who am I gonna be in university? I, I feel, I, I'm shy talking to people. So here are these, these actors teaching them how to express and communicate themselves. And then I joined forces with this engineer and what she does in Mind Blackout is weave through neuroscience, mindfulness, arts, sometimes graphic arts, sometimes this stage communication. She weaves entrepreneurship of the self, of who and what they discover during this course. And we build projects and a lot of the kids that came out of the first project and the second project, we now doing the third project, they open business, they become entrepreneurs, they stepping out in the world more confident. So it's really a passion and I think it's really worth. And all of this should be in school instead of just geography and just, just mathematics, just history. We need to invest in the process of building the self. The other manner is very, it's, it's also, it's a long time project now. I think it has at least 10 years. I think it was really the beginning of wanting to do something social to give back to society what society has given to me. And we started this site where we invite friends and whoever wants to write or show their photographs or show their projects. And projects are about education, um, traveling, society, music, theater, and it has been extremely a extremely project. The biggest challenges are always the, the ones that are closer to you, right? Helping the ones you love, because that's where you need more your flexibility, but where you're not so distant, right? You're not the doctor, you're not the mentor. You, you love, and love makes you feel insecure also because you fear loss. So I think the biggest challenge in my life was being conscious of being afraid 
and shifting from being afraid in that relationship to create a safer place for that relationship where I could really help. That was a big challenge. Not being afraid of losing that person, not as a relationship, but from life. I think we are at an optimum stage to a, for a good change, right? Because we are conscious, first of all, we are conscious of who we are, of our role in the universe. Consciousness is something that has evolved. It wasn't always there in our brain. And so right now it's so mature. We know that we can shift from a position of reactivity, of threat, to safety. We know we can create safe environments for young children, for young mothers, for teenagers growing up, studying. So I think that our biggest challenge is really using this consciousness to create these trusting environments. And we can do it at all levels. And we have all this technology now to help us make this change happen fast. So that all the forces of destruction around that are, you know, that this, there's the, all these possibilities, people talk about wars, people talk about nuclear war somewhere, uh, some, in some places. Well, that's not the world I see. I see the world of possibilities. But for you, for one, for the world to see the world of possibilities, we need to connect in our differences. So we need to integrate differences, not to make a world alike. We need not to be afraid. We need to feel safe. And that will change the world, I'm sure.